بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ونصلي ونسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا واجعل ما نتعلمه يا إلهنا حجة لنا لا علينا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Insha'Allah Ta'ala, we're here today to talk about a science which is from the most important of the sciences which support the Sharia as a whole, and that is the science of Hadith. Before we talk about the science of Hadith, Insha'Allah, I will give you a very, very brief introduction to myself, because today is the first time that I've been to this particular masjid and in fact it's the first talk that I've done as far as I can recall in Bradford so inshallah ta'ala will spend a couple of minutes just to let you know who I am and then inshallah ta'ala we will get on with the topic because it is a very very difficult topic to fit into the space of time that we have but inshallah ta'ala we're going to try and compress it and, and just make it fit inshallah ta'ala so as for myself my name is Muhammad Tim Humble and I accepted Islam at the age of 14 years old. 14 years old is a very young age to accept Islam. And we don't have time today for me to tell you the whole story. But the, the short version that I tell in 30 seconds is that I went to RE classes. And when I was attending RE classes in school, I was so amazed about what I heard about Islam. And so much about what I heard about Islam settled within me and it made me feel like Subhanallah, this is something amazing, this is something not like any other religion, this is something different. And I went home, I went on the internet, I researched it, uh, I did my best to find out what you had to do to become a Muslim. And then I made the decision and I became a Muslim at the age of 14 years old. Uh, I then probably went through maybe four years, maybe five years of struggling to practice Islam. And that's because, and I was discussing this with the brother earlier on, that one of the biggest problems we have in the Ummah today is that we're excellent at selling the religion. We're great salesmen. We get loads of shahadas. Set up a table outside, inshallah, you can have 10 by the end of the day. Plenty of shahadas. What we're really, really rubbish at is keeping them in Islam once they become Muslim. So it's like, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad al Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, fine, next. It doesn't work like that, yeah? You have to think about what you're going to give that new Muslim after they become Muslim. And it's very, 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 very important to think about how they want to be treated, the problems they might be facing, how to overcome them. So this is something I struggled with when I first became Muslim. Newcastle upon Tyne is not Bradford. Uh, there is either very, very, very few Muslims, and there's a decent sized community, but it's nowhere near the size of the community in Bradford. There was probably one or two masajid, at least if out of if we said there was five masajid, probably three of them were completely closed doors to new Muslims. In the sense they were, this is a Pakistani masjid, this is a Bangladeshi masjid, you don't go there unless you're Pakistani, you don't go there unless you're Bangladeshi, that's the end of it. And basically I found those masajid very, very uncomfortable. And alhamdulillah, this was a blessing from Allah because it turned out that those masajid were upon, other than the aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they were upon the aqeedah of worshipping the graves and the aqeedah of calling upon the dead and so on and so forth. So alhamdulillah, Allah Azza wa saved me from that by the fact that they didn't welcome new Muslims. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure that Alhamdulillah, our masjid is a masjid upon the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But on top of the sunnah, inshallah, we are welcoming new Muslims and making them feel comfortable, not staring at them when they, you know, I remember the first time I, I, I prayed in the masjid and everybody, virtually I felt like, and okay, maybe this is not true, but I felt like the whole masjid had turned around and everyone had formed a circle around me. So that's something that's very difficult for a new Muslim. So probably three, four years, um, I went struggling to practice, practicing a little bit, not practicing 100%. And we have to also remember about new Muslims. We have to remember 
about new Muslims. That what Allah says about the Bedouins in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُولُوبِكُمْ Allah says at the end of Surah Al-Hujarat about the Bedouins. The Bedouins say, we have believed. We are mu'minun. Amanna, we are mu'min, we believed. Allah Azza wa Jal says, you have not yet believed, but say we have become Muslim. So Allah Azza wa Jal in this ayah distinguishes that the one who enters into Islam at the very beginning, he doesn't have Iman. He doesn't have Iman. He has the basic Islam that just gets him through the door. And so many, many things he's going to do in his life that are going to go against our Iman, because our Iman is responsible for Obviously, the good deeds that we do are a part of our Iman. And our Iman allows us to do more good deeds and encourages us to do more good deeds because it, it kind of grows itself. The more you have Iman, the more good deeds Allah guides you towards. The more good deeds you do, the more that increases your Iman and so on and so forth. So a new Muslim comes and they don't have a lot of protection from the fitan, from the trials and the tribulations and the troubles that they're going through in their daily lives. Boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, financial problems, all these kinds of issues. They don't have a lot of protection from that. They're not going to say like you're going to say, Qaddar Allah wa ma sha'a fa'al, this is what Allah has given me. I'm con-. And you will get some new Muslims who reach that level very quickly. But for a lot of new Muslims, that takes a very long time to build up. And so you have to remember, as Allah Azzawajal said to the Bedouins, say you have not believed, but you have become Muslim, and Iman has not let, yet entered into your heart. So even if not every Muslim or not every new Muslim is like that, because some of them know so much about Islam, when the time by the time they enter Islam, they have a decent chunk of the basics of Iman and the basics of understanding what that is. But many people will become Muslim in the sense that they will say the shahada, they will understand the most basic concept of Islam, that there is a thing called Tawheed, there is worshipping Allah alone, we don't worship anyone else, right, I want to become Muslim. That person does not have full Iman. They do not enter into a state of high Iman. So you have to bear that in mind. And that can present a lot of challenges for new Muslims, and it did for me. And uh, I think, alhamdulillah, now we are getting better. There are more places offering more support for new Muslims, more masajid are more welcoming to new Muslims, uh, more masajid are more open to having people coming in who are asking about Islam. I mean, to imagine, really, if we're looking at sort of 15 years ago, there were many masajid that did not in any way open their doors to non-Muslims. In other words, this is a Muslim-only zone. You're not allowed in here if you're not a Muslim. And that's not really very conducive to calling people to Islam. Because people are going to sort of say, right, you know, I can go into a church as a Muslim now, I can dress like this, I can go into a church. And they will welcome me and tell me all about Christianity. But as a Christian, dressed like a Christian, can I come into the masjid and ask anyone about Islam? You have to have that, otherwise the opposite side have an advantage over you. And so it has to be welcoming to non-Muslims, it has to be welcoming to new Muslims, according to the ability the masjid has. Of course, a small masjid doesn't have the same ability as a large masjid that might have a room that is just for non-Muslims to come into and have a coffee and have a chat, pick up some free books. Maybe, alhamdulillah, in this masjid, we have a small table outside, there are some, lit- some literature. That's the minimum that you need to have in every single place, and everyone needs to know the script. So everybody needs to know certain do's and don'ts with regards to new Muslims, with regards to how you treat them, how you approach them. Don't try and smother them too much. Don't try and teach them everything you've ever learned about Islam in 25 years, in 10 minutes. And sort of say, and yes, brother, and this, and this, and this. Take them slowly. Take them on the most important issues before the small issues. Okay? So, for example, you know, you, you go to a brother and you literally drown him in information. And you talk about everything from having his thobe too low or his trousers too low to whether what he should wear or what he shouldn't wear and how he should speak and what he should do and what dua he did say or didn't say and whether he did wudu properly or not. And by this time he's completely lost. You need to give him one simple thing and that thing needs to be the most important thing that he needs for that day. And then when he's understood it and digested it and again people 
digest things and learn things at different speeds, right? So some people will be very, very fast, right? Okay, no problem, right? And also, brother, what you need to do is you need to make sure that your, you know, your trousers are above your ankles or your thobe is above your ankles. And that's because the Prophet wasallam said, whatever is under the ankles is in the hellfire and so on and so forth. And you explain with dalil and with evidence. And what the worst thing you can have as a new Muslim that I experienced is the kind of echo effect where you have one guy on your left and one guy on your right. Like shayateen, one on the left and one on the right. And they're both telling you a completely different thing. So you go on one and says, brother, you forgot to wipe your neck in wudu. So you start with, brother, you shouldn't wipe your neck in wudu. So you become terrified to make wudu. And maybe some of the new Muslims don't come to the masjid because they're scared to make wudu that two or three other people are going to start arguing. And then the two brothers start arguing, brother, I'm sorry, wiping your neck in wudu is a bid'ah. I'm sorry, brother, but it's not a bid'ah. And it becomes, the new Muslim becomes in the middle. Yes, we can have this discussion. Yes, we can have this amongst our Muslim brothers sat here today. But we're not going to have that discussion in front of a new Muslim who's just became a Muslim yesterday. We're going to teach him according to the sunnah with the evidence. We're going to teach him how to make wudu properly. One person is going to be his mentor, his teacher. And that person has the final say and everybody else disappears when it comes to issues of ikhtilaf until the person becomes firm a little bit a few days a few weeks and then you can approach him and say to him brother you know i noticed you're doing this in wudu i don't think this is right maybe you me and the mentor can chat together the three of us so you don't feel like it's me sniping at him over you the three of us can get together and we can have a chat so these are some of the problems i had when i first became uh, muslim and alhamdulillah it is getting better now at about the age of 19, maybe 18, 19, I started to really practice Islam again. I met some good brothers. And that's why, you know, subhanAllah, I always remind pre-people that you never know the value of a single word. One brother came to me at a time when I was really desperate to practice Islam. I was really had that burning energy in me to practice Islam. And he came to me and he said, we've got a new masjid, why don't you come along? Probably didn't even take him, he probably didn't even think about it, what he said. It didn't even come into his mind that he thought, oh, this is going to be a strategy to get this brother into praying and to get this brother. He just said, new masjid, come along. No pressure, not like sort of following me around, not banging on my door and saying, brother, come to the masjid. Brother, sign up three days, 40 days, brother. Nothing like that, alhamdulillah. Just a simple, Akhi, you know, I know, subhanAllah, it's been a long time. Why don't we catch up? Come to the masjid. And subhanAllah, it was more of a social thing for me at the beginning. But once I got into it, I got really into it. And I went back to all of the books and I went back to tapes. And I had people around me who knew how to learn Islam. And because they knew how to learn it, I mean, everyone knows, alhamdulillah, everyone in this room knows how to make wudu. Everyone in this room knows how to pray. But that doesn't mean that everyone in this room knows how to teach other people. Teaching is a very unique thing that some people have a gift in and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them in so you find a person who's got that ability to teach got that ability maybe the person who took the shahada from that new Muslim if they're suitable because there's always a link with the person who took their shahada I didn't have anyone take my shahada but I had links with brothers who I'd met in the very early days of me becoming Muslim and so it's a very strong bond come and instead of come to the cafe come to a restaurant come to whatever come to the masjid we'll meet up and then we'll go and get some food so it becomes social. You don't think of it as a big worship thing. Oh my God, I'm not changing my whole life. I'm not abandoning everything I was doing. I'm just simply going to the masjid, meeting some brothers. I'm going to pray there and then we're going to go get some food. Fantastic. And from then it snowballed. At some point somebody said to me, you know, you should apply to the Islamic University of Medina. And he said, you know, and subhanAllah, it was funny the way he said it to me because he said it to me in a way now that sounds completely inappropriate, but at the time, it was very appealing. He said, you know, you can go there and you can come back and you can get a job and your job will just be Islam, related to Islam. Now, that's not something I've done. I don't uh, earn my living through teaching and I don't earn my living through teaching the Quran or through Ruqya or through any of the other things that I do. But at the time, it was kind of like taking you away from the dunya, like that you thinking, Oh, it's not, I'm not going to be stuck in this rat race of nine to five. I can actually go and come back and, and be employed and work in something that is halal. And then you're starting to think, oh my God, my whole life can change. I can get married. My, and, and suddenly things become, you become more oriented on the, on the field of Islam. So the brother put it to me a very good way. And I received a call from a brother out of the blue. 
and he said to me, would you like to go to Hajj? I said, I'd love to go to Hajj, but I can't afford it. He said, no, no, this Hajj will be free. There was Hajj that was paid for by who was then Al-Amir Abdullah Hafizullah, who is now King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia Hafizullah Ta'ala. And he paid for a large number of reverts to come from all around the world to come to Hajj. And again, we, we came to Hajj. And while I was in Hajj, I applied to the Islamic University, got accepted and studied in the faculty of Hadith. After graduating, um, I've done a lot of different things, but particularly what we're focusing on now is sort of teaching. Uh, I'm in the process of setting up a charity organization, inshallah ta'ala, to bring together some of the different works that are doing. I'm an IT consultant by profession, so I'm very interested in dawah that's related on the internet and related to IT and phones and all those kinds of things. So all those are things in the works as well. But one of the things that is really, really appealing to me today is to come to the masjid, inshallah ta'ala, to talk about a subject that we rarely get to talk about. So, so rare. You know, I, I studied in, in the faculty of hadith, and I never thought, I, I never thought, honestly, that we would really put the knowledge to use in the UK. And I was always warned, oh, don't go to the faculty of hadith, you won't benefit anything from it, you know, you won't, you, you, you're just going to learn something that's going to have no real practice for you, you know, you just go and do dawah, go and do... And alhamdulillah, you know, there's good in every faculty in the Islamic University, and there's good in every field of Islamic science. But for me, I was very passionate about hadith. And really, it's very easy to see why you should be passionate about hadith. Because hadith in reality, if we look at the sunnah, the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is what distinguishes between the people who are upon the truth and the people who are upon the falsehood. Everybody claims to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You'll not find a Muslim on the face of the earth who will stand up and say, I don't love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It doesn't exist. You will find every Muslim who will talk about, I follow Islam and this is my and this is my. But what is the thing that is the faisal? What is the thing that distinguishes between the truth and the falsehood? It's the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then look at the attacks of the non-Muslims against Islam. Are those attacks against anything other than the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Is it all against the sunnah? They're against the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, against his life, against his sunnah, against what's narrated from him. The Orientalists attack the Sunnah, the people who have uh, gone into misguidance attack the Sunnah, those people who leave Islam and then come back, they attack what they only one thing they attack. Only one thing. You never see them bother with the Quran. They will attack and attack and attack the Sunnah. And this is because of the ignorance of the Muslims surrounding the Sunnah and the fact that the Sunnah is more complex than the Quran. The Quran is very difficult to attack. It's very easy to, for a Muslim to understand how the Qur'an was preserved. But when we come to talk about the Sunnah and how the Sunnah was preserved, many, many Muslims themselves don't know very much about the Sunnah themselves. And so, inshallah, today, uh, inshallah ta'ala, today, inshallah, we're talking about the science of hadith.